Today our presenters are Peter Cooper and Bonnie Madak, who are both teaching faculty at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or the NCBI. Bonnie Madak earned a PhD in medical genetics from Indiana University and a master's in library science from the University of Illinois. She has been at NCBI for more than 15 years and she's going to start off our webinar. So, Bonnie, take it away. Thank you, Molly. We'll just get the technical things on this end set up. So again, welcome everyone. We will we'll be using the Gene database today to answer five questions that are very common questions. You can get to the Gene resource from the NCBI homepage by adding the word gene to the URL or searching, doing an internet search of NCBI and gene. Gene is a collection of a lot of data from different databases at NCBI. It also has some information within itself, such as the genomic structure of a gene. Similar genes in other species, RNA-seq expression data, and then all of these other databases shown here on this slide are cross-linked from gene entries to those different databases. When the sections of a gene record are collapsed, this is what it shows, all the different kinds of information that is in a gene record. And you can see where you can get the genomic structure, functional information, and sequence records. The sections that we're going to be covering in today's webinar are highlighted in green. Also, the navigational aids that are in a gene record are shown on the right side of the page. And that includes the table of contents for the gene record itself as well as related information, these are those cross-links to the other databases that we have at NCBI. The easiest search of any NCBI database is to use gene, and you can search for a specific gene by using the symbol and the organism name. So the square brackets represent different data fields that you can search. And so you can just put in APRT with specifying the symbol field, and then human for the organism name. The second row shows that the field names can be abbreviated or shortened so that you don't have to type quite as much. If you're interested in all of the genes for an organism, all you have to do is enter the organism name. And there are two examples here, one for zebrafish and then one for corn. I want to point out today that we're going to be focusing on human records. Any model organism would be treated similarly in the gene database as human. Bacteria such as Escherichia e. coli and other bacteria are handled slightly differently for gene. They can be important for human diseases, but we're not going to be talking about how gene handles those organisms today. We're going to be focusing only on human. The webinar today will be covering five questions. We've put these in a general format, and that is where is the gene located in the genome? What are the reference or standard sequences that you would want to see for a particular gene? What variations exist in the gene, and are those variations associated with disease? If we're talking about how a gene is expressed or where a gene is expressed, we would want to know what tissues does that expression occur and under one, what conditions. And then for studies of organisms, sometimes we are not able to do experiments with human tissues or human cell lines. And instead, do we have model organisms that we can use and therefore, we want to identify this 
equivalent or similar genes in those other species, so then we can do some research. As Molly said, we're going to go through each of those five questions and give a specific example. I want to also underscore what Mary said, uh, excuse me, what Molly said, in the sense of that the files in the FTP site uh, have the documentation for the examples for the webinar, and then also extra questions. So where is the gene located in the genome? Well, if we're talking about humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 1 through 22, and then the X and the Y. There's another source of DNA in human cells, and that's the mitochondrion but we're going to focus today predominantly on the human chromosomes. If you do a search for phosphatase, and this particular image is from the Genome Data Viewer, just by doing a phosphatase search, each of those triangles that appear to the right of the chromosome indicate where a phosphatase gene is located. So you can then see why it's important to know where the gene is located in the genome so that you know that you are talking about the same gene as someone else. In the gene record, this is called the genome context and structure, and you can see on the table of contents where those items are listed in the gene record, and I've just included a screenshot to show you the examples for a specific gene. Our first example is that the person has received a lab report back for a patient that they are treating, and there's a specific chromosome deletion that has occurred, and the nucleotides are listed here as far as what is in that deletion. And the person wants to find out what genes are involved. So we're going to go to the web and do a gene search. I am at the gene home page, and I'm going to type in human and then ORGN so that I don't have to type as much. And I get back approximately 59,000 records. One of the easiest ways to specify a location narrowing down on the search is to go to the left side of the page and the filter chromosome locations. If I click the more link, then I'm going to now select human or homo sapiens. I'm interested in chromosome 5 and I'm now going to type the region that the person mentioned in their message and then apply. <clears throat> I now have 93 genes that are in this region. I can change the, lo the display to have more than 20 on a page. The default sort is by relevance. However, for this particular question, it would probably be more informative if you search by or sort by chromosome. And then this will order the genes according to their chromosomal location down through that region that we have specified in our search. So the answer to the person's question is this list of 93 genes. And you can use the Send To button that is there in the right corner of the display to then save the file in whatever format that you or the person wants. So that is the first example question that we have. It's very fairly straightforward. The second general question is to talk about the reference or standard sequences that are available for a gene. And I want to go through what reference is meant in this case. First of all, on the gene, we have the section of the DNA, but if we go to a reference sequence,
standard, we're talking about the genome. We've just talked about where the gene is in the genome. But the DNA are transcribed into messenger RNA or mRNA transcripts. Those transcripts are then translated into protein sequence. So depending on what the person wants, they may want the genomic sequence, they may want the mRNA transcript sequence, or they may want the protein sequence. And all three of those are available from the gene database record. This is sometimes called the central dogma or the process of DNA transcription to mRNA and then translation to proteins. The reference sequence project is specific to NCBI. The records are created by data curators and or computational algorithms. And these are used by researchers and collaborators as reference standards. For the selected eukaryotes that are part of the RefSeq project, again, it represents all molecules of the central dogma. And the main thing to recognize for a RefSeq accession is that they always have an underscore. Excuse me. So the genomic accession numbers will begin with these prefixes. The mRNA transcripts will begin with these prefixes that are listed. And then the proteins are just NP or XP. When you see the X for the XM or XP, that represents the computational predicted models that were used or that were derived from the algorithms. Another way to think about this for a RefSeq project curation is that we have the genomic sequence and the data that are submitted by the researchers around the world, they're submitted to one of the three INSDC databases. And those transcripts, those sequences may be partial. They may be complete. They may have the coding region, which is marked here in yellow, indicated on the record with the start codon and the stop codon. But the REFC curators can look at this group of data and recognize that we could possibly extend the five prime end of the record or the three prime end and add the poly A tail. The REFC data curators will look at this and recognize that there is a transcript without an axon. So they will make a complete RefSeq record that will demonstrate the splicing so that there will be two RefSeq records with the different splicing patterns. In the gene record, you can see in the table of contents, it's near the bottom of the table of contents, the NCBI reference sequences section. And I've demonstrated or I've done a screenshot here of the two pertinent sections of a gene record. The example for question number two is that the person is collaborating with a research group. They've sent a sequence and the person's already blasted it. They've already identified if there are matches and they think that they've gotten the wrong sequence. So they want to get the correct sequence for the MC1R gene. I'm going to go to the web and do the gene search again. We already have the human search, but I'm now going to clear my filters. And I'm going to add the MC1R gene symbol. And so here is the individual gene record for the human MC1R gene. If I click on the NCBI reference sequences section for the table of contents, we see two sections in the gene record. One is the genomic and one is the mRNA and protein. 
The genomic this RefSeq gene record is an independent, standalone genomic record. So this would solve the person's question if this is what they wanted. It's a genomic sequence so that you can click on the variety of formats. If they want the mRNA transcript, you would just click on the NM record. I'm going to click and open that in another tab. And then also if they want the protein sequence, I'm going to click and open that in another tab. So here's the NM or the mRNA transcript record. It's 3,100 bases long. And then depending on if what format they want, this might be the sequence that they want. And I'm just scrolling down to the bottom so you can see the sequence. And similarly for the protein record. <clears throat> now, I said that the genomic record, the genomic sequence could be found in the RefSeq gene record. This is for the individual gene. It's a standalone record. I'm going to stand, um, scroll down a small amount to show that you could also get the genomic sequence within the larger context of the chromosome. And then this is telling you the specific nucleotides on chromosome 16 where this gene is located. And there are two assemblies. There's the reference assembly and then an alternate. So depending on what they want, you could get genomic in two places within the gen uh, chromosome context or with the RefSeq gene, and then the mRNA transcript, and then the protein. The next question is about variation, and Peter's going to now continue. <clears throat> Thanks, Bonnie. This is Peter Cooper, and I'm going to answer the remaining three questions uh, with Gene. And the three things we need to address are th uh, the very topic of variation. We're going to look at gene expression, and then we're going to try to find homologs in other species for a particular gene. So if we're interested in um, variation in disease, there are really two parts of the record we're going to look at. One is the phenotype section of the record, which links out to things like MedGen and OMEM, uh, and the ClinVar section of the record, which links out to medically important variants that are present in our ClinVar database. And then there's also another tool called the Variation Viewer that lets us see all the variants in one place, those that are in ClinVar, and those that are just sort of in our generic um, variation database called dbSNP. So on the record, this is similar to the slides that Molly, that, um, I'm sorry, Bonnie was showing. Um, you can get access to the variants uh, from the table of contents there, uh, and the variation part of the record has links to the ClinVar and links to the variation viewer. Okay, so the example that I'm going to do is about uh, single nucleotide variants in tyrosine hydroxylase. And I've cheated a bit and broken my question up into three parts. Um, we're going to see what diseases can be caused by variations in the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. Uh, then we're going to try to get a list of all disease-causing single nucleotide variants that affect the coding regions with their positions. And then finally, are there any common protein variants for this gene? And I'll talk more in a minute about what I mean by common variants. Okay, so I'm going to do what Bonnie did and go to the uh, web pages and do a search for things. So we're going to be working with the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. And so we're back at the gene record that Bonnie was using. And so all I need to do to find tyrosine hydroxylase, um, what I did was a more generic thing previously. Uh, so let's just see if I don't have the actual um, gene symbol, but I can type the name of the product that it makes. So I'm just typing the name of the protein product, which is tyrosine hydroxylase. I'm going to search that. Now, Remember that uh, Bonnie has this sorted by chromosome, so I'm going to change the sorting, and I'm going to sort by relevance. And so what will happen when I do that is that 
the tyrosine hydroxylase record that I want is going to float to the top because it is, in fact, the most relevant thing. I'm going to go ahead and retrieve the record. Okay. And so we're going to first look at the question about uh, are there any diseases that are caused by variations in this gene? And I can go to the phenotype section of the record here. And this talks about um, a couple of different kinds of things. First thing uh, that you see are these associated conditions. And these are conditions that are essentially caused by um, variations in this gene or something near this gene. Um, the one that's listed here is Sagawa syndrome. And I won't bother to go to the MedGen record, but I'll just tell you what it is, and you can visit that yourself if you want to. Um, and basically, this gene, tyrosine hydroxylase, in, is involved in uh, producing L-DOPA from the amino acid tyrosine. And so these people who have this syndrome have uh, Parkinson's-like symptoms because of the lack of L-DOPA in their brain. The second kind of phenotype that's associated with a gene has really to do with genetic linkage. Um, so there's a variant uh, near this gene that, that's genetically linked to a particular condition. That doesn't mean it's causative. And these are things that you find by genome-wide association studies. So for example, there is a sec the second uh, study there is a genome-wide association scan for variants associated with early onset prostate cancer. And there is a variant uh, near this gene that is associated with it. It doesn't mean that that variant is causative. It's just genetically linked to some other variant that is causative for that. OK. So I think we've answered the first question. Let me go back to the slides. OK, the second sort of general question we're going to answer is, in what tissues and under what conditions is the gene expressed? So we have a fairly new part of the gene record, which is basically deals explicitly with gene expression. Um, and this is based on the alignment of RNA-seq. Um, this is next generation messenger RNA sequences that are coming from various libraries from different uh, body parts or tissues. And you can basically count them and normalize those counts in such a way that you can sort of compare expression. So for example, in this, this chart here, we see high level expression of whatever gene this is in gallbladder. The other um, type of data that addresses gene expression is data that are coming from microarrays. Um, and these are the data that are present in a database that's linked to gene called GeoProfiles. Uh, and we'll talk more in a minute about those. As you can see in this particular example, this is a cell line that's been exposed to influenza A. And whatever this gene is, um, it's increased expression in those samples that have been exposed to it versus those that have not been exposed to it. So something about influenza increases expression of that particular gene. So you can get access to the expression data directly in the gene record by following a link um, from the table of contents. And that will jump you down to that histogram that we showed you a minute ago. And then you have to use a related data portlet on the side, um, which will take you into a different database called GeoProfiles, where we can look at some of those um, profiles across different samples for a microarray experiment. So again, I've broken my question up into uh, several parts. And one of the parts is kind of a bonus uh, question, which I'll answer using the RNA-seq data. Um, so we want to know what normal tissues is this gene, which is a mitochondrial transporter. It transports phosphate into the mitochondrion. Uh, the gene is called SLC25A3. So where is it expressed? Are there any microarray experiments that show changes in expression of this gene? Uh, and it is a fact, and we'll see in a moment that's true. This transporter has different splice variants. Is there a way that I can see whether any of these particular splice variants have tissue-specific expression patterns? So let's go back to the web pages. And I'm going to run a gene search again. I'm going to type human with the organism field tag, ORGN. And then I'm going to use the gene symbol. In this case, it's SLC25A3. And I'm going to use the symbol field to restrict that. 
Typically, when you do this kind of search, you go right to the record. This should be one of them. Okay. So here's another gene record. And, you know, if you want to, by the way, if you want to know something about the biology of the gene, there is a nice summary here. I don't think we really pointed that out to you before, but just be aware that it's there. So it tells you basically what I told you about it, that it is a transporter that transports phosphate into the mitochondria. So in this case, we're interested in gene expression for this gene. So I'm going to go down here and jump to the expression section of the record. And you can see that these, uh, this table here shows you uh, expression levels of the gene in various tissues. You can see high level expression in heart, for example, and other tissues. These data are from the Human Protein Atlas, um, which is a, a set of experiments that look at different uh, levels of expression in these various tissues. These are from uh, autopsy specimens. You can also check other uh, sets of data. Here's the Illumina Body Map 2 transcriptome. So we also see high level expression in heart there, but also we can see that it's expressed in skeletal muscle, um, which is one of the tissues that wasn't present in that other data set. And then we have sort of our bonus question, and to do that, where we're looking at expression of different um, variants, uh, splice variants, you can see the alignment of the three different uh, NM style uh, RefSeq mRNAs aligned to the genome. And you'll notice that the second transcript there, NM underscore 00588.3, has a different third exon um, than the one below it. And so that um, may be expressed specifically in different kinds of tissues. And if you look down here, we have sort of another histogram that shows you the uh, exon coverage. These are alignments of the RNA secretes to the genome, and they sort of highlight the exons of the gene. You can certainly see those two exons right there. Then there's another track related to gene expression, which is the reads from the next gen data that span the introns. And you can see the counts of them down here. These actually, it turns out, are a better way of looking at expression. They're a cleaner set of data. It's a kind of a, an odd looking display where you sort of get the exons shown as these sort of valleys here. What I can do is go up here um, to the tracks menu and I can change the expression tracks that are available there. There's a set of recommended track sets here. Notice that I can pick the expression tracks. And those will load up for me. And this is a, a bug that we ran into the other day, but we thought was solved. I should have listened to Bonnie. She told me to try this out before I did this. Um, so one of the things that's missing here is I don't see the uh, skeletal muscle track where we should see a nice little dent right here where that extra exon is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to do something a little bit more advanced. So I'm going to go to this configure tracks menu. This is a problem with live demos, as we know. And I'm going to search for a track for skeletal muscle. So I'll go ahead and load the intron spanning reads track for the skeletal muscle. And there it is. So you'll notice that that different exon is quite clearly the one that's expressed in the skeletal muscle.
Um, and so we'll have to look into why that did some load with the expression tracks like it did before. But that's what happens with live demos sometimes. Okay, I'm going to go back to the um, slides. And address the um, last question that I was supposed to address, which is what are the equivalent genes or homologs of other species? I'm going to take a minute to introduce this topic slightly. It's an important concept in biology that's been extended to uh, molecular biology, the concept of homology. And so this is sort of a classic example of um, homology in biology. So these are the four limbs of six different vertebrate species. Uh, we got a turtle, a dolphin, a porpoise, human, horse, uh, fruit bat, and a chicken. All these four limbs do slightly different things, but they're all involved in locomotion. And they can all be assigned, uh, they're clearly made out of the same parts. They're descended from the same structure uh, embryologically. They rise from the same embryological structures in these uh, organisms. And we believe that that's because the ancestor of all of these animals also had a forelimb with these parts. Um, so that's the concept of biological homology when we're talking about body parts, for example. That can be extended to uh, genes. So one thing, just to summarize, homologous structures are derived from a structure present in a common ancestor. And like I said, the common ancestor of the tetrapods, which all these animals are, had a forelimb with similar components to it. So if we look at uh, another part of two tetrapods, uh, human and mouse, then we can see that there are equivalent genes. There is an albumin gene in human and an albumin gene in mouse. Um, they have a similar structure. They even have a similar genomic context so that we believe that the common ancestor of mice and humans had an albumin gene similar to this one. And we believe it probably had a similar function. And that's one of the important things about homologs is that you can study them uh, in different species and extrapolate the results to a certain extent. I'm going to just introduce another tort term. Uh, that's orthologs and paralogs. And orthologs are the ones that we're most interested in. Those are genes that are separated from each other by speciation events. So when the ancestor of the mouse and humans split off the two different lineages, their albumin genes went about their merry way evolutionarily. There's another kind of homolog that's called a paralog. And that happens when there's gene duplications within a lineage. So you can see, for example, albumin, alpha fetoprotein, and a famine. Those are the ALB, AFP, and AFM genes here. They're derived by gene duplication. So the relationship among those is those things are paralogs or paralogous genes. We'll come back in a minute to that point. Um, so why do we study these? Because they may have similar functions in different species. This is most likely for orthologous genes. And model organism systems extrapolate to human and are easier to use in experiments, obviously. Just as sort of an aside, um, BLAST is a tool at NCBI that was originally designed to identify homologous proteins. This is an important part of you know, evolutionary biology and general bioinformatics research. So where do we get homology at NCBI? There are two main places to get them uh, from databases. One of them sort of is within gene, and those are the orthologs. Remember, those are the ones that are the equivalent genes. Those are derived from our genome annotation pipeline. We sort of find them when we're annotating other genomes. The other separate database is homology. This is a, an older database that has selected genes, I mean, has genes from selected eukaryotes. So the orthologs from the annotation pipeline is restricted to vertebrates. Uh, homology takes you back to the base of the eukaryotes. If you really wanted to see if there was a homolog in a bacterium, you would have to use BLAST to do that. So where do you get access to the homologs? Uh, in the gene record, there is a homology section there that will take you to the two links there. Um, also, there's a shortcut on the left-hand side there, right below the summary of the gene um, that gives you access to the mouse homolog, which is the one that people would probably be most interested in if they're going to study it in a model organism, or to all of them we've identified with the genome annotation pipeline. Okay, so the last question is only a one-parter. Well, it's a two-parter, but I haven't split it up. 
how can I find protein sequences for the homolog of the human MLH1 gene in the channel catfish and in yeast? So let me go ahead and go back to the gene record. So here is the search we used before. I'm basically going to just change the search to get the MLH1 gene symbol. So here's the human MLH1 gene. This is a, a well-studied human disease gene. Um, it's often mutated in some hereditary cancer syndromes. And what it does, basically, is repairs damaged DNA. Um, the particular point of this example, though, is to not talk about that so much, but to look for homologs in other species. So let me go down here to the homology section of the record. And I can see the link to homology in here, where it says homologs of the MLH1 gene. And then the orthologs uh, link here, which goes to the vertebrate orthologs. Let's start there. I'll go ahead and get the 203 orthologous genes from the gene database. And notice what that link actually does is it runs a search. So I have this sort of term up here that says ortholog underscore gene underscore 4292. And then group is the field here. And this gives me all of these orthologs that are basically identified by comparison to the human gene. So it's all based on that human gene identifier up here. Um, and so I, I can simply add an organism search to this thing. So channel catfish was a common name, but it maps over to the uh, scientific name. So I can just type that in. If there's a recognizable common name, if there's a one-to-one -one mapping in our database, we do that. So I don't have to know that Ictalurus punctatus is the scientific name of the channel catfish to do this. And I got one record, which is the identified homolog of MLH1 in this fish. So as before, as Bonnie did, I can jump directly down to the reference sequences section here. And now I have access to um, the genomic sequence. The main thing I asked about was to find this protein. Notice this is one of those XP proteins. Um, it's derived from the translation of this XM. These are gene models or gene predictions based on partial messenger RNA sequences that we have in other databases. For a lot of organisms these days, um, we have a genome, but we don't have much in the way of traditional kinds of GenBank transcripts to make the NM or NP style reference sequences for those. OK, now I realize that I completely messed up. Well, not completely. But I did mess up something, and that is I didn't bother to finish my variation example. <laughs> and you might not have even noticed that, but uh, I did. So I'm going to go back because I didn't finish that one, and I think we need to go back and do something with that. It won't take long. I don't know. No matter how many times I practice this, it's never perfect. And we were interested uh, in variants of that uh, solute transporter. Well, Bonnie's coaching me over here, but I don't know. It would take me almost the same amount of time to do it that way. She wanted me to use the advanced search. Uh, so we can go back to our solute transporter, which we were working with before. And remember, there are um, the questions that I was trying to ask um, that were important. We found out what the disease was. We didn't look for disease-causing mutations in this disease and we, in this gene. The, and we also didn't um, see if there were any common variations. So I'm going to go back to this one. So I can go to the variation section of the record. I 
So, first thing I can do is to go back here to go to C variance in ClinVar. Let's go ahead and do that one. This is going to be the database that has um, clinically relevant variants in it. And the question was, can I get a list of the variants that are pathogenic, cause disease? So notice ClinVar has a list of the variants here. I can pick, the, there are five pathogenic variants here. Then I can identify the ones that are uh, missense or nonsense codons that will change the uh, coding region of the gene. So I can download this list directly from here. And then if I want to see if there are any common variants in this gene, I can look at these in the variation viewer. And this is just a good way to get a, another table. It also gives you the genomic context of these variants. This is the viewer up here, which we won't focus on particularly right now. But notice that I can identify whether there are any common variants for these genes. I notice that there, we have these things down here. What we're going to be talking about is sort of a, a insider term here, it says MAF here. What that stands for is minor allele frequency. And so I can pick ones that might be a missense variants. And I can identify those that might have a minor allele frequency. If I was going to talk about common variants, that would be a minor allele frequency of greater than or equal to 1%. There aren't any here that are like that. I can find those for other genes if I want to. But I can find the ones that have a measurable minor allele frequency here. And there are 14 of them here. This is from the 1,000 genomes population here. So I can get a list of all the ones that are potentially uh, measurable in the population from this table right here and download it. OK. Well, let me go ahead and stop here. And I will turn it back over to Bonnie, I think. Let me go back to the. You're right, I didn't. I don't know what's wrong with me today. So I didn't do that one either. She's right about that. So I can do that one too. So now I will go to the advanced <laughs> search now to find that one down here. Okay, so this is my, this is the history. This, most of you are familiar with this from working with PubMed. I can go to MLH1 here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is to go back to the homology section of the record. And now I'm going to find the homolog in yeast, which is beyond the scope of the annotation pipeline here. And I'm going to go into that one, this is homology. This is an older resource that's based on um, a set of completely sequenced, well annotated genomes. Uh, and it is no longer being updated, um, but it's still useful. So I can see uh, the gene records for the different organisms here. I have gene records from mammals. I have them from other animals like insects. I have them from fungi, and I even have them from plants, which means that basically the most recent common ancestor of those various organisms is at the base of the eukaryotes. So we expect that the common ancestor of all the eukaryotes would have a gene like this. So the one I asked about was the Saccharomyces cerevisiae gene here, and I can click directly here to get to the reference sequence protein, which is what I was supposed to find. And there it is. This match repair ATPA's MLH1 from the Saccharomyces.
Okay. I will leave, let Bonnie come back. Thank you, Peter. So today we've reviewed, or just for me to review what we've done in the webinar, we've done these five general questions. We've shown an example for each one, and in the material that is in this FTP path, we have extra questions as well. So we provide how to walk through the examples that we did in the webinar and also some extra questions that you can do on your own. And if there's anything else I left out. And if there's anything else that Peter has left out, it's in the handout, in, in order. In order, yes. <laughs> I'm now going to open up a poll to ask which display of the gene record do you prefer? This will be helpful to us here at NCBI to know whether you would want to have the gene display be the same as what it is, and that is all of the sections are open when you go into a record, or if they are all collapsed so that you can see where to navigate more easily, or if you want to have it set by your NCBI account settings or no preference. So I'll just give a few moments for that poll to be answered. This will also be a good time if there are any other questions. I did provide some more information on the question that was asked earlier, and I think I do want to go out of the slides to go to an earlier slide. I'm going to go back to the slide that has the human chromosome shown. Let me do this the correct way. So I mentioned that the chromosomes are named with the P arm, which is usually represented at the top when the chromosome is in a vertical orientation. Then the centromere is this narrow restriction of the depiction of the chromosome and then the Q arm. So the question that someone asked during the webinar was the fact that the 5P, the P was not included in the search. And indeed, depending on how you want to do your search, that may or may not be needed. But what I answered is, was that the chromosome numbering starts with the top of the P arm, and it continues through the length of the Q arm to the very end. So you would not have a chromosomal location of 5Q and then bases 200,000 to 5 million because that is representing the top part of the chromosome. So I wanted to show the depiction of the chromosome again. And I'm going to escape out of that so I can go back down to the end of the... I'm going to close the poll. So that we can capture those results. And if there are any questions, we can answer them. As Molly said at the beginning, you can receive continuing education credit by completing an evaluation. And I believe that Molly will be putting the evaluation link in the chat pod.
Hey, Bonnie, we have one more question. And just to see if there's any other questions. I'm going to have Peter address the question about homology not being updated. So um, I did mention that homology was not being updated. And somebody asked uh, why it's not being updated. Basically, um, it wasn't being used very heavily was one problem with it. And we needed the developers and the people involved in that database to work on other projects, basically. The intention has always been to expand the coverage of the orthologs from the annotation pipeline. So right now, the limit of that is the vertebrates. Um, we have annotated a number of plant genomes, and we have not yet annotated uh, fungal genomes ourselves. The Saccharomyces annotation did not come from us. Um, but once we start including those, then we should be able to expand that coverage to include um, other eukaryotes. For bacteria, we really don't have a, a database for that at the moment that's being maintained. Um, you, you pretty much have to use BLAST to do that. Another question that was asked was the maximum number of results that someone can download in XML. I'm not sure. This is Peter again. So yes, that, if you're using one of the APIs to try to download results in XML, um, it gets a little bit um, unpredictable and unstable at high numbers, I think is the right answer to that. Uh, we typically tell people not more than 250,000 will work. Um, there are ways of managing that through the uh, URL API, I mean, not the URL API, through the uh, e-utilities to do it in batches, which is the proper way to do that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. If you do have any other questions, you can send to nto at utah.edu.